have opened doors for young girls like myself. I know you think, oh, look, she did it. Now look at her. But understand, if it wasn't for the Mahas and the Mary, everybody, every single person, even my sister Nahna, who runs an organization I've known for to almost 20 years, these are women in our community that have opened doors and told us never to be shy about who we are and to always, always be proud of our inner roots. And thank you so much. So every kind of, especially my Palestinian events, you always want to know, min win, min win, min win, min win. It's true. It didn't even fit the word polka, it's just a hand polka. A boy, a boy, a little man. A boy was from Beit Hamida. I know that it's not the boy and man of the guys competitive in Hanaida, I know. It's like, who can wear the more the more that? Um, it's true. We're so strong Palestinian women. And those that know Alakama Sisi Shama, some cousins are here. I love it because I get to find more and more of my family now that I'm in Congress. Everybody's my cousin. Thank you. I have a bully block. I have a bully block. I have a bully block. And when I ran for office the first 
time. I remember a boy, a guy, she did go to me about a woman crazy after 9 11. I'm gonna vote for you. Come on. And in me, I only have one baby, I have Adam. And he was cooking. Mama, my man, did she give you a call back? She's like, are you not going to have any more kids? I'm like, oh my God, Mama. I'm working for, for state representative. Mata la walaya. Shuma na shubakni. Sisi shuma na shubakni. Hey, my shmula, shubakni. Mata la walaya. Mata la walaya. Mata la walaya. Mata la walaya. Shuma na shubakni. Mata la shubakni. Mata la shubakni. And then she goes to me. Yeah, I'm just shubakni. I'm a jowaja. I'm a jowaja. I tell her all these things. I'm married. I got kids. And then I go to her sissy, I'm a honey, I'm a shah, I'm a shah, I'm a shah, I'm a shah. It's like, I feel great, it's so amazing, but it's amazing that the humor that I have with my family members, they keep me moving them along. But even when I ran, I would tell people, I would door knock, I would say my name is Rashida Tlaib, I'm the eldest of 14. I know what it means to have challenges in your life and for people to be able to hear those challenges and have a desire to help. And they go to me, oh, that's good. So where do you live? What do you do? All of these other things. And then I tell them about the things that I've done and they don't care. They don't care that they can't pronounce my name. They don't care about my ethnicity or, or, or that I'm Muslim. Even to this day, they're like, yeah, yeah, our state represent. I think she's Pakistani. I don't know what she but, the way, but what I love is that even now, most of my residents who defend me to the national media because the Washington Post came to my district and they tried to think that they were gonna, they were going to like somehow find stuff on me. I was like, I want to show you Detroit. Nobody's gonna have my back as much as Detroit will. And I can tell you from the Lyft driver, from the Washington Post guys, the Lyft driver was like, knew your family. I was like, mm hmm. And then they were like, then I got another driver. You knew your, it's like your family's everywhere. I said, well, if my residents get me, they get my whole family. My sister, she counsels victims of sexual, of sexual, survivor, sexual assault survivors, domestic violence. My brother, my brother Ibrahim, he literally, all he does is work as a veteran center, helping homeless vets do the Urban Learner Program and help them find a job. My other brother, Rashad and Rashid, there's a Rashad, Rashid, and a Rashid. Rashid, okay. Rashid, he, all, all he does is this access, access, they call it. And he does these youth engagement. And I remember when I was running for office the first time, my brother Ibrahim left his job, volunteered to run my campaign, drove me crazy. And then we door knocked, I think, 10,000 doors, raised a little bit, like 70,000 or nothing. Nobody thought I could win, and I won. And Michelle became the first one to win. And then, like, it's amazing, like, the, the, I kept winning. And then the third time, they redistricted me, right? Hakuni Maka, the you know, mother state representative. They said, oh, no way, she's going to be here. She's African American, whatever. I outwork the hate, the bias, everything. I went door to door and I didn't stop. People knew that I wasn't going to waver, that I wasn't going to sell them out. And we won that last term. And then years later, you know, ran for state senate and everything. When I thought about running for Congress, I would get tight. You know, not because of my background, but more because, oh my God, how am I going to get to 700,000 people? That's how much you have, 700,000 people. And how am I going to raise the money? Because people run for Congress, they start a year out. We started in February, I believe. Literally within the six months before the primary, and I have to win the primary. We don't have runoffs in California, they have runoffs. If I win in the primary, call us. I win. So we have to, I had six other Democrats. I do, we do in our 55,000 doors. A Khoi Rashid, when he found out it was time for first place, had that a, what do you mean time for first place? I said, you got this. I said, she I got this. You think it's easy? I had to raise all the money. He goes, damn, Rashid, you got And then he wins. He went and got a golf cart. This is Palestinian stuff. Got a golf cart that I had from in Ohio. I'm great with that one right there. And then he goes, okay, pull up, give me a list. I gave him a list of 4,400 people. He got on the cart, I got pictures on my Facebook. He literally, all these like air kids were like in the back of the thing. He would get into one block. Think of a cul-de-sac and subdivision. 
He would stop the car and they would jump out of the golf cart and they would go door to door. And then they were great. Even on, on the day of the election, I was in, in one of the cities and they were like, yeah, yeah, I know you. Uh, the golf cart guy came to my house. <laughs> and the Detroit Free Press did a great story. Talib's brother's golf cart won the election. <laughs> And people at first were like, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, nothing. They really didn't think anything of it. And I was like, no, I'm a I told my son, yeah, I said, yeah, mom, did you go on the She goes, okay, mama, did they get a hammer? I said, yeah. My mom was just thinking, oh, it's no big deal. And my mom was like, I'm not sure, oh, mama, oh. I said, I have it, mama, it's a big deal. And I didn't know it was going to be this big of a deal. I, I'm dead. I could have never imagined it. I just knew I was going to wear it. And so as I was going, I was telling people, do you know what was interesting? And it was because I was out of love, but some of the older kind of Palestinian, you know, supporters were like, you should have maybe not, don't wear it, you know, how is it a nasty legend, I'm just like, no, it's true. Because I want my, the young women and the young, I want the young children to know this. Our parents want us to be so proud of our heritage, you know this. My dad used to make me do the death gun, I mean, every day. Because he wanted me to not forget where I came from. And I want you to notice that there's these moments that your parents are so scared for you that they tell you, so my these elders in our community were telling me, please, I don't know, maybe it's not a good idea that she done. And I said, sure, I'm a good deal. And I said, oh, like, it's not a big deal. And I said, yes, I'm going to wear it. And it was this young woman named Susan Dalaj. 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 I got it. She decided to say two year old. And it became this huge phenomenon. And I wrote uh, why I wanted to wear it in Elle magazine. And they asked me, they said, you know, oh, as soon as I put it up there, it looked so viral, so quickly. And it was crazy because I had just taken the picture to send it to the frequent, but they were like, what are you wearing? I said, this phone my mom made. She said, oh, like, you send it to us. And, and it was interesting because my mom was like, why is everybody asking me the thought where it is? And I said, Mama, I don't know. It's just, it's a big deal. And so when I walked in there and I said, saw the things online, I was like, wow. From a little girl that didn't speak English when I started school, I was born here, but as, I'm, as, as being the eldest, my mom, you know, went up to eighth grade education. She didn't speak English when she came here. She was pregnant with me on the plane from Palestine to America. And when he, I remember the little girl sitting there watching her like a the uh, 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 lamp, and she used to sit in the corner, not on a chair, on the floor, up against the wall, and she used to hide it. You know, just, she would put one leg up and she'd hide it. And I don't really cry, but I cried either. But I, she just used to just, I remember watching her just sewing and sewing. And I told her, Mama, why didn't she go continue eighth grade? She goes, I have to make money. I have to go work as a chayata. Um, and I, and I had to drop out of school at eighth grade because I had to go to sh like go work in a tailor place, like a, in, in fact, a chayata. And, and where the school meant to me to show her I can be successful, I can learn all of these things and still stay very rooted. And I have to tell you, even seeing the young girls across the world wearing the clothes, it was beautiful. And I wanted people to feel that, you know, somebody said to me, I want them to remind them over and over again, I didn't have to change anything about me. When I went to the doors, where are you from, whatever, are you like biracial, where are you? I said, I'm Palestinian. Oh, I said, yeah. I was like, I'm, I'm, my, my, I have a little grandmother actually in Ramallah. Where's that at? You know, talk to them, no big deal. And then they were like, wait, aren't you the girl that took on the Koch brothers when they dumped this, the waste on the river? I said, yep. Yeah. So, oh, you're the Koch girl. I was like, no, don't say that. It sounds really bad. <laughs> um, but as I went door to door talking to people, 
about who I am, I never shied away uh, of or even trying to change my name or change how I was approaching this or hide that I was about freedom full of steam or that I was against occupation or that I was against oppression of people. I didn't hide any of that. And I made sure that I always reminded my residents how it connected so much to the continued black oppression in our country. The fact that I grew up in the most beautiful blackest city in the country, Detroit. I don't live in your money, Jamal. I live in Detroit. I'm dead. I'm dead. And, and every corner is a reminder of the civil rights movement. I had teachers teaching me. This is a neighborhood that I couldn't live in because of the color of my skin. I couldn't work there. You couldn't, when you had integrated in marriages, you couldn't. And to this day, I was telling one of my colleagues, I have two cousins who are married to Israeli, Russian Jews. Their marriages, I think, until recently, wasn't even recognized. Again, so much of what I learned growing up from my you know, African-American mother in Detroit is something that I so much connect with what's happening to my family in Palestine. And it only awakened when I was 12 years old and I saw the two lines. I saw the different color license plates, people on one side of the sidewalk, remembering going in the Baha, literally going in the Baha with my cousins and all the, all the people walking out like we had some disease, like getting out of the water. And remembering, oh my God, this is exactly what happened to black people in our country. Being less, felt less than and, and unequal is so painful. And I always tell people when I talk about Palestine, like it's out of love for my sympathy. Who tells me after I won, you know, I see I, she woke up at home and all these media were in her house. She's like, she woke up and it's like, but she never could. And she goes, okay, call us, how you call us see? I was like, Cindy! <laughs> I know Cindy will be, I was like, it takes a lot more to bring Palestine to me. She's like, okay, that's it, we are to be precious. No, it takes a lot of work to humanize you, to humanize my cousins, my uncles, all of the people that I love so dearly in Palestine. And it was really wonderful when I told her, I said, Sissy, I'm going to bring a delegation to Palestine to all the 20 other Congress members. She was going to look this day on the other book. And I was like, Sissy, and I was like, and I told my colleagues, they have a lot of colleagues that are very interested. I said, listen, you have to, if you don't go to my grandmother's house so she can cook, I would be really in trouble. Like, we have to go to her house. And so we're going to do a really great, what I call, community conversation with people in Beit Orufoka and Beit Orufoka, all of my friends, and bring people together to talk about what it means. I mean, just the daily lives. How policy is it now? Daily life of impact. My cousin Barak started Vice for Palestine. And I love it. I love what he's been able to do. But even talking about that and how that relates to the fact that everywhere they go, they hit a wall. Right? Everywhere you go, they're disconnected from the rest of the, the communities. And as I continue my activism, I know I'm never going to be perfect. I am one of you. Even when I curse at the president. <laughs> Came and we asked him, we got interrupted his speech. One got up and said, I'm a union. 
what you think of labor rights. I want to know what you think about social rights in the workplace and so forth. And then I was like number seven. I get up and I say, have you ever read the Constitution? You read the Constitution and they're dragging me out. My mother, my brother, and she calls me and goes, Sid, did you just get a real mom's crying? Did you think you got arrested? And I was like, I was like, what did you tell her? And he goes, I don't know. I said, are you arrested? I said, how am I arrested? I'm answering my cell phone. <laughs> and then he goes, I don't know. She's really upset. And so I call her after a couple hours. I am mom. She didn't have a mess and think I'm going to become a shirt. I said, young mom, it's the most American thing I can do. I have to ban this man in the Constitution. She goes, No, so it's not. But I'm telling you, I'm a I'm dead. She goes to pray with her girlfriend on Friday. And then it's up at the J. Allen. Mashallah, 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 and I get up and I'm like, well. So my mom calls me. She says, I said, yes, young mom, you're still mad. She goes, oh, my mom's so proud of me. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 